You can see American influence all over Manchester. A lot of it we could do without. But you might wonder, why a statue of Abraham Lincoln in Manchester? Lincoln was president of the United States during the American Civil War. It became the war to end slavery. It's one of the best documented wars in history. But the part that Manchester played in this history is largely forgotten. They called it Cottonopolis. It's still said with pride today. In the 19th century, Manchester was the workshop of the world. You'd be hard pressed to find someone in the world who wasn't wearing cloth from the mills of Manchester. There was so much cotton moving through the streets of Manchester that they had to install these iron curbs. The heavily laden cotton carts were constantly cracking the stone ones. On the 12th of April, 1861, the American Civil War started. Almost immediately, Lincoln announced the Union blockade of all southern ports. The Union thought it would cripple the southern economy. And the Confederates thought it would backfire and bring Britain into the war against the Union. The effect was devastating to Britain, specifically Lancashire and Manchester. Almost 80% of the cotton used in Britain came from the southern states. Without it, the mills of Lancashire fell silent. Less than a year into the Civil War, the effects of the cotton embargo were taking their toll. When the war began, there were two and a half thousand cotton factories in Lancashire. They employed about half a million people, and more than double that depended on the cotton trade. The cotton supply dried up. Soon there were less than 500 mills. Most workers were laid off, and the few that remained were at best part-time. It sent shock waves throughout the entire nation. Dock workers, merchants, even coal miners were out of work. No factory. No need for coal. It became known as the Cotton Famine. The devastation it caused is unimaginable in 21st century Britain. By the second year of the war, Families were destitute and starving. The dark satanic mills of Manchester were well known to Frederick Engels. After all, his family owned one. His book, The Condition of the Working Class in England, is the best account we have of the people who worked in these mills. Life here was horrible. Cotton was king, and its servants worked in the mill. But now, they didn't even have that. They lived hand to mouth, but they were amongst the best paid of the working class in England. In the southern states of America, though, there was another class of humans. If cotton was king in Manchester, in the southern states of America, it was a brutal tyrant. The worker bees of Manchester were well aware that the last hands that touched the cotton were the slaves of the southern states. They had a deep hatred for slavery. In 1788, the first petition demanding an end to the slave trade was presented to Parliament by the people of Manchester. Manchester had a population of about 75,000 in 1792. Over 20,000 signed the petition to end the slave trade. Well before the Civil War, there were committees raising money to support the Underground Railroad, helping slaves escape the southern states. Manchester and the north of England were at the forefront of social change. 
Chartism was a significant working class movement for political reform. The battle for the right to vote started just across the River Irwell here in 1838. In 1833, after many heated debates, Britain itself abolished slavery. The fight for freedom was nothing new here. The working class of Manchester clearly saw the link between their lives and the life of a slave. Opinions were divided. Some wanted Britain to intervene to end the blockade and resume the flow of cotton. More Confederate flags were flying alongside the Mersey than there were in the southern states. Most of the mills in Lancashire supported the southern states, or at least saw support as the best way out of this crisis. But not all. Some wanted an outright end to slavery, no matter the cost. It came to a head on New Year's Day, 1863, with the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln declared that all the slaves were free. This galvanized opinion in Manchester. I've been to a few crazy New Year's Eve parties, but I can't imagine what happened here on New Year's Eve, 1862. In anticipation of Lincoln's proclamation, over 6,000 people packed inside here. The purpose of the meeting wasn't your regular affair with a countdown at midnight. An advertisement appeared in the Manchester Guardian. Workers condemned British capitalists and journalists for their support of the southern states. The meeting contributed to Prime Minister Lord Palmerston staying out of a war with the Union. By the end of the meeting, the working people of Manchester have produced a letter of solidarity to Lincoln. The letter concludes, the erasure of that foul blot on civilization and Christianity, chattel slavery, during your presidency will cause the name of Abraham Lincoln to be honored and revered by posterity. Despite the unbearable hardship caused by the Union blockade, the working class of Manchester chose to throw their support behind Lincoln and an end to slavery. Lincoln was well aware of the weight of this letter. Within a few weeks, he replied. The statue bears an extract from his letter. I know and deeply deplore the sufferings which the working people of Manchester and all in Europe are called to endure in this crisis. It has been often and studiously represented that the attempt to overthrow this government, which was built on the foundation of human rights, and to substitute for it one which should rest exclusively on the basis of slavery, was likely to obtain the favor of Europe. Through the action of disloyal citizens, the working people of Europe have been subjected to a severe trial for the purposes of forcing their sanction to that attempt. Under these circumstances, I cannot but regard your decisive utterances upon the question as an instance of sublime Christian heroism which has not been surpassed in any age or in any country. It is indeed an energetic and re-inspiring assurance of the inherent truth and of the ultimate and universal triumph of justice, humanity, and freedom. I hail this interchange of sentiments, therefore, as an augury that whatever else may happen, Whatever misfortune may befall your country or my own, the peace and friendship which now exists between the two nations will be as it shall be my desire to make them, perpetual. But the workers still faced poverty, starvation, lack of heating, and eviction. John Bright of Rochdale reached Lincoln through Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, asking if a few cargoes of flour could come as a gift from persons in your northern states to the Lancashire working men. I am one of the thousands that were filled with flour and sent by the free states of America in the ship George Griswold to the starving people of Lancashire 
whose miseries were caused by the aggressive and civil war of the slave owners in 1862. This barrel was sent as part of an aid package to the mill workers of Northwest England by Abraham Lincoln and the people of New York and Philadelphia on the 9th of February, 1863. The relief ship George Griswold docked at Liverpool carrying boxes of bacon and bread, bags of rice and corn, and 15,000 barrels of flour destined for the starving people of Lancashire in recognition of their support of the northern states during the American Civil War. It was greeted on the dockside by an enthusiastic crowd of nearly 4,000 people. When Lincoln was assassinated on the 15th of April, 1865, in his pocket was a letter of support from John Bright. George Gray Bernard's bronze statue of Abraham Lincoln was initially intended to stand outside the Houses of Parliament. It was to commemorate 100 years of peace since we set fire to the White House in 1814. The sculptor took a warts and all approach to the statue. It was judged to be too unstatesmanlike for Southern tastes and dubbed the stomach ache statue. A lifeless dower, more statesmanlike sculpture was commissioned for London. Bernard's statue remained homeless throughout the First World War until Manchester stepped in. It was unveiled in Platt Fields in 1919 and later moved here to Lincoln Square in the town centre in 1986. There is an afterlife and we will be judged. It may not be by some omniscient being, but we will be judged by history. Let's hope Manchester still has the spirit of the brave people of the cotton famine and are judged as favorably. <laughs>